Good morning, everybody. It's uh, 9.30. Uh, we are starting the second day of the POLIS conference and you are uh, participating in the session getting ready for the next decade of parking policies. Uh, the session is uh, chaired by Elie Dalouin from uh, Lille Metropole. Uh, Lille Metropole also holds the chair of the uh, uh, POLIS uh, parking working group. So we are very happy to have Elie uh, for this session. Um, I'm here to give uh, bit of uh, wayfinding in the housekeeping rules. Um, so there's one way to communicate with panelists and with the session chair, and that's by using the chat. Uh, make sure you use the session chat and not the uh, event chat, because the event chat is read by all uh, conference participants. The session chat is actually directed to, um, to the panelists and to the, um, uh, to the session chair. Um, we will pick up on questions or comments you give in the chat. Um, we will um, uh, highlight uh, interesting comments, interesting questions for Ellie to, um, um, to bring into the panel discussion. You can have a look at the uh, other participants by moving into the people's uh, section. Also there you can move into the session um, uh, aspect of the people's uh, people section and see who else is uh, joining us here for the parking session. Um, you have the ability to move around your own screen a little bit to see the things that you you are interested in the most. So you double click on the uh, on the part of the screen that you're interested in the presentation or the speaker and that will maximize on your screen. Um, and then when the session is done, you can always uh, try the networking function so you can find people, uh, send them direct messages uh, and also meet them uh, through video chat. Uh, you can also visit the uh, exhibition area, which can also uh, be interesting. And you also find uh, in the exhibition area and um, boot of the Park for Sump project, a project that will be represented later in the panel uh, by um, Birgitta Morin from uh, the city of La Rochelle. Um, join the conversation also on Twitter and uh, use the hashtag POLIS20 for that uh, discussion. Um, and that's it for me. Um, Ellie, I will disappear uh, from stage um, and I give the floor to you. Um, so uh, all, the, all the best for an interesting session. I'm not far away. If there's anything, I will uh, reappear again. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ivo. Good morning, everyone. I hope you hear me. Um, if it's okay, I'm glad to be the chair for this virtual session. I hope you, your close people are fine and the professional context is not too hard during this period. We are in the middle of a crisis. It's an uncertain period, even for the mobility and parking policies. In the same time, today and every day in our jobs, we have to decide what we expect for the next decade of mobility and parking policy. Data, mass, curbside management, communication. We have already he heard these topics. Maybe you work on them. Uh, and we think they, and we think we, they will continue to be the main topics in the next decade. That's why they are what we discussed today with our four speakers. These presentations will offer you methods, ideas, tools, and I hope a lot of questions you can ask in the chat. I propose we, we start with Sabine's company. Sabine, can you come on? You are already on the stage. Uh, you can share your presentation and I will present you shortly. Um, look, so you follow study of business administration at Fonfort University. Then you obtain a doctorate of business administration from Cone University. And since 2019, you, you take part of research lab for urban transport in Frankfurt University of Applied Science. 
your research focused on econometrics, urban mobility, and urban logistics. The stage is yours. <laughs> Thank you very much, Ellie. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for introducing me and giving a short introduction to my work and my presentation, Novel Approaches to the Estimation of Temporal Distribution of the Demand for Parking Space. Well, urban mobility management and especially parking space management requires the knowledge of the demand of parking space in order to plan parking space concepts and parking policies. In a recent completed research project, which was funded by the State of Hesse and the Road and Transportation Research Association in Germany, we analyzed the possibilities and limits of determining temporal distributions of parking demand with existing data. On the one hand, data from parking space management and on the other hand, GPS trip data. Our research was focused or our research area was a medium-sized town near Frankfurt. Why we have chosen this research area? Because it is located in the Rhein-Main area where we are able to um, observe uh, commuter inflows and outflows as well the public transport system was well developed and there are park and ride facilities which were able to observe. Well, for our research area, we were able to analyze over 2.5 million inflows and outflows from car parks, as well as approximately 570,000 parking tickets from parking meters, all for the year 2019. Furthermore, we obtained GPS trip data from mobile or built-in navigation devices and we analyzed waypoints from more than 5.4 million trips starting, ending or driving through our research area also in the year 2019. So what does temporal distribution of parking demand mean? Well, the de temporal distribution of parking demand means inflows and outflows of parking traffic as well as parking space occupancies by hours of day and also possible days of week. An example is shown here on the slide and what we see here is the aggregated temporal distribution of over overall demand groups of the inflow parking traffic in commercial and industri industrial areas in our research area. On the vertical axis, we see the percent of daily inf inflow traffic in percent of the daily traffic, um, the percent of the daily inflow traffic. And on the other axis, we see the hours of day. And as expected, the inflow parking traffic is highest in the morning hours. Uh, between 7 and 8 o'clock in the morning when employees come to work and then it flattens out. These distributions are shown either aggregated over all demand groups or differentiated by demand groups. So these demand groups are inhabitants, employees and students, customers, visitors and guests. And it is obvious that the demand on parking space differ between demand groups, so the characteristics of the parking processes differ. Uh, you imagine an employee comes, so the inflow parking traffic of an employee is highest in the morning hours and it uh, is highest, the outflow parking traffic is highest in the later afternoon hours, while an inhabitant um, has or inhabitants have the highest amount of the inflow parking traffic traffic in the in the evening or in the af later if afternoon hours and so it differs well these distributions can also be calculated by city area types and in traffic planning area types are classified by considering the parking space available and these area types are the city center, the old town area near the city center, residential areas, commercial and industrial areas, and what we added, park and ride areas. 
Well, temporal distributions of parking demand are published, for example, in stationary traffic guidelines and are often based on manually surveyed observational data. So that's this column. Um, that is the status quo. In Germany, for example, such, such stationary traffic guidelines are published by the Road and Transportation Research Association. Parking space surveys are time consuming and expensive. And a further drawback is that data becomes obsolete relatively quickly. Furthermore, only a few streets are observed and therefore the transferability is limited. So we use existing data, parking space management data on the one hand and GPS strip data on the other hand. Parking space management data is a low cost data treasure which communities and towns can easily access. These data are generated automatically and permanently, so they are not in danger of becoming obsolete. Data can be updated, for example, annually. GPS strip data are often seen as a miracle solution for solving traffic planning issues. However, the procurement costs are relatively high and advanced knowledge of data processing and analysis is necessary. So, how did we proceed? Well, first of all, we had to prove if the required information, the start time and the end time of each parking process observed is available in the data. Given that, we can determine the parking duration of each parking process. If not, we had to check whether the estimation or predi prediction was possible. So data on inflows to and outflows from car parks included all necessary variables. So that's unproblematic or that was unproblematic. Data on parking tickets from parking meters included the start time of the parking process and the amount of money which was thrown into the parking meter. So we had to assume that drivers on average paid the right amount for the desired parking time. Additionally, we had to prove whether observed trips in the GPS trip data were really parking processes. So that was quite challenging. We had to run a complex algorithm for that. For example, to distinguish parking processes from simple traffic jams. So that was really challenging. Second, we assigned each parking process to a city type area. Uh, city area type, sorry, what was straightforward. So the assignment to city area types was preceded by geographical assignment of city area types in our research area. For the assignment to demand groups, we applied an assignment scheme based on information about the parking time, the parking duration and the location of the parking process. To give you a small example, a parking duration of less than three hours near a shopping center during the opening hours of the shopping center suggests that it is a parking process of a customer. Finally, we aggregated the inflows and outflows for each hour of the day by demand groups and each day of the year. The parking space occupancy was determined by counting all overlapping parking episodes for every minute of the year and by averaging it, we obtained mean parking space occupancies by hour. So what are our results? Well, data from parking space management are low cost data. They are well suited for city types with uh, city area types with high parking pressure. Sufficient data are available in this type, uh, city type areas, namely the city center and the old town center near the city. In residential areas, however, data from parking space management are missing or too small. 
So on this slide, I show you only two examples for the temporary distributions of parking demand by demand groups and city area types, which we have uh, determined using parking space management data. And of course, all graphs differentiated by demand groups and city area types are available in our research report. I came later uh, on this point. Well, one point is important. Problems arise if parking management offers daily or weekly parking tickets. Why is this so? This is frequently the case in commercial and industrial areas and park and ride areas. And in that case, a determination of the exact end time of parking is not possible. So for example, a 24 hour parking ticket does not mean a parking duration of 24 hours. So parking processes with daily or weekly parking tickets had to be removed from the analysis with respect to parking outflow traffic and parking occupancies. And in these cases, parking space management should be changed in such a way that entrances and exits can be observed. Maybe um, the, the parking space management can adapt their barrier systems, systems so that they are able to observe also the exits uh, from the parking space. Well, regarding GPS strip data, I can state the procurement costs of this data are relatively high and we were only able to generate plausible results on an aggregated level. The data analysis was challenging since we were so far not able to calculate parking durations for all trips. But we need parking duration for first calculating parking occupancy and second, assigning the parking processes to the demand groups. Um, what was the problem? Well, each trip has a device ID in our data and this is a random number which is randomly assigned to the GPS devices for data protection reasons. But for the determination of parking durations, we need trips that led to a parking process and trips that drive away from a parking place with the same device ID. So the time between those two trips can then be interpreted as parking duration. But here too, further assumptions were necessary as the GPS, GPS device may not have been switched on for a trip in between. So this would lead to an overestimation. So we therefore had to define a spatial distance of 30 meters. And as a result, to make a long sh uh, story short, we could only de determine parking durations for only 8% of our GPS trip data. So predicting the parking duration using a statistical forecasting model was not successful, successful either because we had too few explanatory variables. So what, uh, what I want to say is that uh, still further research is necessary in the context of GPS trip data. On the slide here, I show you also two examples for aggregated temporal distributions, which we obtained using GPS trip data. And of course, you can see the other, the other, sli uh, the other graphs in our research report. One point is in, uh, in important that uh, GPS trip data could be a good choice for resident residential areas because their public um, parking space management data are missing or weak. So I reached the end of my presentation. I hope I was in time. Thank you very much for your attention. And um, the final report of our research project is available at our website, relat.de. And I will gladly answer your questions now. Thank you, Sabine. Uh, this presentation shows the importance of the data. We need data for diagnosis to know the uses and the users of the parking space. We are so see that it's a difficult job to do. We need to have methods and some tools before starting and ask our, ourselves the good question to give a framework to the reflection. We have a few questions. I see uh, what... <laughs> um, Ivo asked few and we have 
Olga and Prinka. Why was it so expensive to procure the required data? Uh, well, the GPS trip data was expensive because you uh, you have we have to buy them from a private company. So in our case, it was the company Inrix, um, which is famous or which um, which offers um, GPS trip data, and well, you have to buy them. And the the advantage of um, uh, of parking space management data is that the communities have this data in their data treasures, so they they can use it. Yeah, they ha don't have to buy it. Um, we have another question about metals. Uh, few questions at the same time. Is uh -huh. there data you would have liked to access but was not available? I haven't under, uh, understand your question now. Can you repeat it, please? Is there data you would have liked to access but was not available? So data were not available. Um, I is ah here I see it. I can read it. Is there data you would have liked to access but was not available? Um, in our case, for our research area, it was. Uh, it was fine because we had a good contact to the commu uh, community, so we we got all the data needed. Um, one one aspect we we haven't uh, looked for is that we had the parking space management data from the com community, but there are also some private companies um, operating car parks in our research area, and because the research pro uh, project was only a, a, a short-term project, so only a few months, we weren't able to to ask them to to give us data. So, uh, you know, the, the the big players, Abcoa in Germany, or, or also. Um, the Deutsche Bahn, which um, um, have car parks in our research area. So that is one thing which we could do uh, in a, in a follow-up project to include also this data. We have another question about data. Mm -hmm. Is the GPS trip data suitable for both on-street parking and off-street parking? Yes, they are, um, because we can give a positive selection where the, the parking could take place. And if we see that the, the start or, the, or the, the, the end point of this GPS trip uh, waypoint is a, a, a car park, it's fine, you know, so it's, suitable for on and off street parking. Okay. Um, maybe we have a, another question about methods. Uh, which methods did you use to select the parking groups? Was this deductive or inductive? Um, can I see the, the question? Have you got predicting data for MPG? Uh, um, which which question you asked me? How did I, I the, 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 uh, the question from from Stefan Schmidt? How did you validate your methods? Did you collect run throughs? Did you compare results from different data sources like parking management and GPS data? Uh, yes, we compared uh, three methods. So we compared our analysis from uh, parking space management data, GPS trip data, and we had uh, the stationary traffic guidelines. Um, um, and they are sim they are very similar. So that is to the question regarding the validation. How can you collect or manage parking in places where parking is free? Yes, that's the problem. That's really a problem. So that would be um, the the advantage of GPS trip data because they also um, uh, can show us free parking places. Um, but with the GPS trip data, we are still um, that still work in progress. So we have a follow up project um, where we have to settle all the problems which we have um, up to now with this GPS trip data. So we are in the beginning with the GPS trip data to uh, use them for um, determining temporary distributions of parking demand. Thank you, Sabine. I think yeah. we stop here and we move to the next speaker.
Thank you for your okay. presentation, your answer. You're uh, welcome. You can answer the, the other question in the chat. Okay, I will do that. With direct messages, maybe. Okay, um, bye. I invite you to leave the stage and Stephanie can be with me. Hi, Stephanie. Hello. Hi. I'd like to, I'd like to share your presentation mm -hmm. when I'm short biography. Uh, you are the head of marketing and customer relationship at free time. You have been part of the mobility industry for more than four years. Before that, you worked on the field of sustainability and renewable energies. You support cities and regions in the implementation of mass that sustainability improve urban mobility and for the benefits of travelers and residents. Exactly. <laughs> Thank you for your introduction, Ali. Thank you. Um, okay, I think I will start now so that we stay on schedule. So I think I don't need to introduce myself anymore, but I think I will start with a few words about Fluid Time. So um, Fluid Time is an international company that focuses on mobility as a service. That means we combine, combine transport offerings such as bike sharing, car sharing, as well as taxi and parking um, to make it available within one app for citizens, um, employees or other travelers. And we are the technology partner for companies and public authorities so that they are able to offer digital mobility services. For that reason, we provide um, different wide level services that make it possible to integrate and standardize transport offerings. And we were founded in 2004 and are based in Vienna. And today I want to tell you about one of our projects that we did with uh, Goldbeck. And Goldbeck is a subsidiary company of Goldbeck Parking. Uh, Goldberg Parking is a subsidiary company of Goldberg, and Goldberg is Germany's largest family-owned um, construction company. They have more than 7,000 employees at 70 locations around Europe, and they manage uh, more than 155 parking structures, in, mostly in Germany and Austria, with more than 80,000 spots. And today, um, I want to tell you more about the project that we did together. For that reason, I think I. I don't need to show you how a, a multi-story car work looks like, but I think um, at least one of you did once park in their lifetime their car in one of these uh, really nice buildings. Sometimes they're open, they can be closed, modern, below ground, above ground. So there are different and um, various reasons why you go there. But um, Goldberg wanted to change the fact that you just go there if you want to park your car there. Um, for that reason, they contacted us because um, they had the idea that um, parking should be part of the travel chain. So they wanted to make it as a starting point, an in-between point or an end point, as, um, so that you people go there with the private car and they change to another mode of transport to go um, the, the other part of his trips. And they already had the right project um, to work on this together. So um, we started to create mobility hubs in newly developing residential areas in two locations in Vienna. The first one is Neu Leoboldau and the second one is Sonnenfeld Lost. And these two quarters are really special in Vienna because they are like a microcosmos um, of various things. So you have a lot of green areas, you have a kindergarten, coffee shops, grocery stores on site as well. They are in walking distance to public transport um, stations. And our objective was to transform the parking structure of Goldberg parking that is on site to mobility hubs as well. Our second um, step was to change the mobility habits of the residents. And third, we want to foster the local businesses and uh, to strengthen the community. And now we show you the, the single steps that we did um, on this way to transform the, the living place for the people. So our first step was to provide easy access to, public, um, to the people. 
And for that reason, we launched Wander. That's the first free public transport app in Vienna. So there are a lot of um, public ones, but this one is a private one. And we launched it in mid June 2020. And um, until yet, we have more than 7,800 uh, users. And we opened up the, the user base to more people so that um, we got more feedback for bug fixing. Um, we could easily, um, let's say, we, we could always improve the app and how it was working for us. It has a route planner integrated for the metro, the tram, buses, and trains in Vienna, as well as in surrounding areas. And it provides a departure monitor with real life arrival and departure times for all um, public transport stations. Um, as you see, uh, we have already good um, ratings and reviews and in, in both app stores. And we really work on that too, so that we can improve these numbers. So our second step was um, to extend the coverage of Wander to other parts in Austria. Because we recognize that um, people don't um, stay just in Vienna. They want to travel with public transport around Austria. And there is no app that offers um, it in an easy way to go wherever you want for public transport. So we say, okay, we, we will extend it. I will tell you a little bit later why we did it now, but um, for, uh, the first thing was to provide it to the residents and the non-residential users so that they can travel across Austria. Our third step was to extend the parking across Austria. For that reason, um, Goldberg Parking collaborates with other parking providers um, so that wherever you go with your private car, you can always use the app to find a multi-story car park and to obtain further information anywhere in Austria. Our um, fourth step was to integrate sharing services. Um, that means, as I said before, we wanted to create a transfer zone in the multi-story car park of Goldberg. So there are bike sharing or car, sh car sharing stations on site next to the, the car park. There are, we will integrate e-charging stations. So you can use the app to search, book and pay for the use of sharing services. And you can make reservations with it, for example, as well. Our fifth step is um, to make booking reservations available for parking slots because um, we uh, know that um, for private car owners it could be really stressful in the morning when you're on the way to a meeting and to know if there will be available park slot for you so you can make a reservation in your preferred um, park house and you can just pay with the app and our second um, our sixth step was um, to enable user group functions um this um, point is needed due to the fact that we open up the app to a larger user base so we have the first user group are the registered residents so they get uh, the main app functions like the info routing and booking of all the services across austria but as well they get special features that are just made for them in their neighborhood and these are functions like um, they can book community rooms for a yoga session or a private party. They can rent a shopping trolley for the grocery grocery store um, visit. And as well, they can get tools or other um, common tools where they can share on site. So we wanted to have no reason left why they need to buy something or they need to go somewhere else. And as well, we wanted to have it on site. So they, we want to um, strengthen their community on site. Then the second user groups are the registered normal users. Um, so when you register as a normal user or a traveler, you can use the info routing and booking uh, across Austria. So you can pay within the app for all sharing services that are integrated in the app. And non-registered users can, of course, use just the app as they do already. So they can use it, use it for the route planning as well as for the departure monitor. Um, our second step is more like an, uh, a small incentive system to foster green mobility of the residents. Um, so we are looking for partner companies um, in these areas like um, 
a hairdresser, a coffee shop, or where a place where you get flowers or tools, wherever. And as soon as you go there as a resident, you can collect mobility points that you can redeem later on for sharing services. So uh, in a smart way, we we can create a stronger community. So that's what we all hear right now, um, buy locally, invest locally. That's what we want to do in these neighborhoods, just for residents in the neighborhoods. So that they need don't need to go outside of the neighborhood if they want just a coffee. And as well, we can foster that um, you try once in your life an e-scooter or bike sharing. And yes, this is mostly the, the trickiest part of our whole um, step plan. Um, we want to roll out the app to further residential areas. And that's why we, we had this, um, this bigger step to, to make the public transport available in, around uh, Austria so that we get more users, we get more feedback. And our customer has um, like a, a back office where he sees whenever someone uses the app, he sees the, the demands, the, the reasons why people go somewhere, the most interesting um, destinations they're going. So and these informations are really important for other transport service providers that want to open up a new business or that um, who wants to extend to another area as well. So for us, it was important to foster a dense network of local service the services that want to collaborate with us. And for this reason, uh, we need all this data and information so that we have a stronger app even in, in, in the future in other areas around Austria, but as well as in Germany or in Switzerland, so wherever Goldbrick wants to open up. And yeah, Goldbrick once told us that we are their ideal partner for this transformation process and because we were able to to integrate the whole spectrum of mobility for them and i think what's um the most uh, nicest part what we said that we could jointly reinterpret the understanding of living space together and i'm re really looking forward on where we are going with that and i'm already reached out of my presentation and i hope um, that you've enjoyed it so thank you and i will i'm open for your questions now Thanks, Stephanie. Your presentation reminds us parking is a service. The off-street parking can offer many mobility services, not only related to cars. And I think we have a question about the relationship with the Weiner Leinen, the Vienna Public Transport, which has published their own app. How is it function between your solution and this? Can you say again the name? Because there, there are a few apps already. <laughs> we are so, uh, uh, what do you mean? Can you write it on the chat, please? Waiting for. Ah, uh, no, no, no. Okay, so you mean the? Ah, uh, wait, I now see. Ah, uh, okay. Um, now I see. So, um, Wiener Linien, yes, it's the public transport provider in, in Vienna, and um, Fluid Time had a, well, still has a strong uh, cooperation with it because um, the, the one uh, mentioned in the chat, it's called Wienmobil, and it is based on a research project that we, uh, Fluid Time, did together with Wiener Linien. And they continued with this project, but um, these are totally different projects. So they do what they do, and we and Goldberg we go in a different direction. But it, I think they do as well make uh, available bike sharing and car sharing, but they don't focus on the other parts of Austria as well as they don't focus on parking. Okay, we have the, another question about partnerships. Uh, do you aim to establish partnership with local communities for municipal parking as well? Or would you provide parking payment just for Goldberg? Uh, that's what we did uh, on last Thursday. So Goldberg went to their, I don't say how we call it, like a the parking community of Austria to present um, our plan and what we want to do. And they really are enthusiastic and they want to do it. and. 
Um, so they are, they are really ready for the first step to be integrated in the app, to make it visible in the app where all the parking structures are. The next step with their integration for payment, they don't know what they get from it. So um, we really want to go there. We want to make it available for them as well. But um, in the end, the, you need to look um, on, the, on the, let's say on the money transfer. So we need to find a way that they get the benefits and um, gold back as well, because the app is free and it should stay free. Um, but if we provide booking services to other parking structures, of course, there needs to be a, like a transfer fee or something like this. But we need to do this in bilateral uh, discussions with the parking providers. But we are definitely open to that. And I think the discussions are working really well. Okay. Uh, another question about your app. What is the advantage between Wanda and the international operating apps, for example, Google Maps? Mm -hmm. So, um, I'm not sure, but uh, uh, what we say, of course, is that um, Google Maps works with um, like not on-demand data. So they um, integrate standard data, what they get from their public transport providers. And we are working with real life data. So whenever there is an interruption or a delay with the public transport, it is visible in the app. And that's what we are focusing on. And uh, it is an app that doesn't own your data. So you can you just use the app, but we don't take or track you. We just see you as an anonymous ID if we want you, but we don't sell your data or we don't use your data for that reason. So what I said in, in the answer, the last step is what we can do, but we just do it in a, in a safe way. And I think with Google Maps, you, you, I think everyone knows it, how it feels when you use Google Maps and in the next five minutes you get advertisements for the restaurants that, that are nearby your next destination. And that's what Wanda will never do to you. And yes, we want to ex uh, expand to other countries because um, as I said, Goldberg is like a really big player in Germany. And um, we had like, Vienna is our small playground now with our 2 million inhabitants here. So everything what works in Vienna, I think will work in Germany as well. And we have all this um, discussion and talks now and around Europe. So whenever there's a residential area that needs an app, Goldberg will go there, provided services to this residential area and we will go to other cities and we will integrate more transport services on site as well. Okay, thank you. I think we can, you can, last question. Mm -hmm. uh, this is this one. With so many technology companies promising to deliver similar and exciting projects, how are our cities uh, able to confidently procure the right project for them without potentially wasting limits resources? Uh, <laughs> no, I, I think what we have here is um, Goldberg is private and flu time is private as well. And for us, um, the city is the place where we provide mobility and where people use mobility. So we don't partner with the city of Vienna for this project and that makes it easier for us on the one side because we can act fast, we can go to other places and we, we don't need to wait um, for them to approve for something. But on the other side, if we want to get big and to expand to other cities, it's always nicer to have the public authority on your side. And that's especially um, when you have hard regulations for sharing services, for example. So if the city is not open for collaboration and if the city is not open for a good um, mobility market, then there is no sense in going to other places because then we just can provide public transport in the app. And I think that's not enough for travelers nowadays. So they want to do everything in one app and they want to make it easy and comfortable. Um, but to do so, we need a good collaboration with public and private players. Thank you, Stephanie. I think we have to move to the next speaker. 
Um, thank you. Thank you. Uh, we think it's Annie right away that will be in the stage with me. Yeah. Hi, Hi, Annie. Um, I, may, I will make a short biography and you can you can make your presentation, sorry. Thank you. <laughs> On the stage. Uh, Annie, you are a business analyst for mobility at Appai Way and Collie is a woman in mobility hub in London. You had spent over six years working across the mobility industry and was voted Best Connected Car Mobility Spokesperson in Auto Connected Car News in 2017. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, hi, good morning, everybody um, from all around Europe and I think the world. Um, lovely to, to be speaking to you today. Um, I'm Annie Redaway, Business Analyst for Mobility at Appy Way. Um, Appy Way, we are a parking and curbside management and data company based out of London in the UK. Um, today, we'll be talking about how that kind of curbside and parking aspect relates to automated mobility in future. Um, I realize this session is called the next decade of parking policies, but actually um, this might go a little bit, little bit further into the future um, as I'll be discussing one of probably the most hyped until our friends, the e-scooter came along um, future mode of transport, which is the autonomous vehicle, focusing on a Innovate UK funded project that we led at Appy Way alongside Jaguar Land Rover, Coventry City Council, Milton Keynes Council and White Willow Transport Intelligence looking at the operational questions around how to enable parking um, for automated vehicles, so automated valet parking. Um, it was the first project to look at scalable commercial and regulatory model for parking for level four and level five automated vehicles, as opposed to the kind of technological aspect of how the car would actually park. Um, it was an interesting project to be involved in, and I'll be sharing some of the highlights today. Um, so firstly, um, why the curbside, why mobility? Um, how do they interact? The curb is actually a key piece of the puzzle for the future of mobility, be it scooters, buses we already have, electric buses, um, but increased modal and use case complexity will lead to a higher demand for curb space and a change in how curbside access and regulations are managed, especially as we move towards connected and automated mobility. So how will this work technically? How will these vehicles ingest this information and react? Um, what will the business model look like? Currently, a lot of the business models for cities in the UK, at least, is based on parking revenue to maintain roads, transport for schools. How will this change that if we no longer own our cars? And how does regulation need to change to enable it as well? Um, well I'll be going into some of this in more detail. So Park AV, as I said, um, funded project that was led by us um, alongside partners from private and public sector exploring and building the logistical and commercial framework required to facilitate this as part of an integrated mass offering. So we took from the beginning a presumption that assumption that mobility as a service would be the, the main model in the future. And to do this, we, we took into account a lot of aspects and some of them were the user journeys. So to illustrate kind of the logistical complexity of what it was that we were looking at, um, I'll focus at the beginning on just an example of the story of Lucas, a guy living in London, say, um, taking advantage of a future mass solution to go to a comedy show. Um, so just walk through this, walk you through this quickly. So the scenario around six o'clock, you want to request the AV to deliver him and his housemate to the comedy club by seven. So the AV parks close to their house where restrictions allowed. Currently outside my house, we have resident bays. Don't know in future if an AV would be able to stop there. Later, delivers them at the comedy club where they're able to do pick up drop off. Lucas goes in. He doesn't really need to think about the car because he's not driving it. He doesn't need to think about parking. Personally, this is a nightmare for me. I hate parking, <laughs> um, parking my car in London. Um, so how do you access? The car needs to get serviced. How does it get charged? Presuming it's an EV, cleaned. It needs to go somewhere then. It also needs to go somewhere until it's requested again. And then of course, later, once Lucas leaves the comedy club, another AV can come pick him up, deliver him and his housemate home. And then the last piece, which is actually quite a key piece for a lot of us, um, how to process that payment. Got to pay for the parking, pay for the charging, pay for the servicing. That all needs to be done. Um, I know that a lot of the mass companies are out there trying to solve that at the moment, but parking payments in particular can be quite a nightmare, um, especially in the UK. 
So that for Lucas was pretty easy, but we still need to understand how the vehicle does all of this, like how it's enabled, the permissions and permits that are required, um, how to be serviced, um, where it needs to go. Um, so we looked at this as the project. So we took into account things such as the physical setup, kind of where physically is the land that the car is using, um, the digital integration flow of data um, between partners, the flow of money, um, integration between the partners, public sector and private sector, integration with future services such as charging, and of course the user experience as shown by the, by the experience that Lucas had. And that's just one of many use cases. Um, so going back to today, um, what is this even possible today? If you take out of the equation, kind of the levels of automation we have today. Um, so the curbside in the UK, at least, is a very complex environment. Signs can be confusing. All the regulations are paper-based, static. Normally, one bay has one purpose. And if it has more than one purpose, it's quite difficult to police and enforce. Um, it takes six months to change a traffic regulation order, which is how the parking is managed in the UK on street. So in future, kind of three key areas, space, how will different use cases use the curb and parking regulation? How will an autonomous vehicle know where to stop? Um, and business models, as we mentioned before, currently very parking led, how will that change? Um, knowing where to stop compliantly is key. And just to give you an example, um, London has I think 14,000 kilometers of regulated curb space for parking, most popular being residents paid. And then we've in London got 34 separate London authorities in charge of parking across one city. This is all very complex. And I think someone was saying earlier about how we going to manage this across all the different areas um, for any mobility company. So we also had a look at if we took today's curbside restrictions um, in the UK kind of where in theory could a could a automated vehicle park? Um, taxi bays is one example that's currently for this purpose. Free bays, um, as in ones that don't take a charge, but they're very rarely near to points of interest. Line paint, so this is actually regulation back to the UK. So single line, you can stop, double yellow, you can't. Um, in theory, you could use that, but if lots and lots of vehicles were using the service, then it wouldn't really work in the long term. Bus lanes, bus stops, another example of complexity. In theory, you can pause in a bus lane, but you cannot in a bus stop. And then in London, we have the red routes, um, which you can't stop at at any time. So one of the other things we need to look at was who's involved in all the stakeholders and the customer requirements. So we spent quite a lot of time um, mapping out who they might be. We also consulted with parking operators kind of off street as well. Um, so for example, the data requirements from the parking side, Jaguar Land Rover looked at what would need it from the vehicle, and we as the parking technology company looked at the parking. Um, but then you've got the data requirements from the local authority. So Coventry City Council, Milton Keynes Council were really fundamental to understanding um, and building the storyboard for this project. And just to give an idea of the complexity involved, I won't go through this in detail, but this is the data model um, from Jaguar Land Rover and us at Appy Way, showing kind of just how many different points and types of data and stakeholders that are involved that need to be combined and shared and, and processed. Environment, the vehicle, town and road infrastructure, the fleet operator, um, the mass app. We had Fluid Time presenting earlier. Um, how are they going to process all of this data? And of course, the customer. We also looked at kind of the timeline. Now, obviously this is dependent on se sector capability, but what scenarios would we have for parking as we move more and more towards level five autonomy? So the short term feature on private cars, there are already some cars with park assist, for example. Medium term feature on a private car or a fleet car that supports multiple use cases. Uber is one example, and then newer automaker brands like Link & Co, which are focusing more on a subscription model rather than ownership. But then, of course, fundamentally, eventually, um, in the longer term, if we imagine that private car ownership is history, we actually came up with the concept of mass park. Um, so parking, this is on the bottom right, I don't know if I can use my arrow. Um, no, parking for mass, providing dynamic curbside access and integrated payments, which is a very different way from how parking is managed today. 
So finally, um, one of the key outcomes for the project that's actually got us a lot of traction. I'm happy to go in with more detail, um, but don't have quite the time today. Um, we did calls for action for UK central and UK local government. Now these are very, very specific to UK law, but some of them can be applied internationally. And we found that a lot of them, even though we were talking about autonomous vehicle parking, they, a lot of them, if done in the shorter term will enable changes now, even if we don't have automated vehicles in the future. So one, for example, um, digital and dynamic traffic regulation orders is the second point for central government. This is something that currently is a very difficult, non-interoperable system in the UK and would enable faster changing of bays. For example, we've got, we've moved forward the ban on ICE vehicles as have many other countries. This would enable us to roll out the EV infrastructure and change the EV bays much quicker. Um, in COVID, we've had emergency cycle lanes. We had emergency powers to ignore, not ignore, to fast track the traffic regulation order process um, to enable those cycle lanes. The other point, standards for interoperability for parking payment systems. This is an incredibly fragmented market in the UK and you cannot go in as one provider and assimilate all of the payments, got to negotiate with each individually. So even if we don't have autonomous vehicles in the future, this is something that in the shorter term will enable mobility as a service and will enable dynamic mobility. From the local government, I think one of the most interesting was looking at the, the change in the business model for parking. So to be able to take on the risk, to take the changes that are needed to be made to enable a system such as this, why don't we look at wholesale prices for parking or changing the way that land is used having someone come and bulk pay for a one to two year contract gives local authority the confidence to be able to spend the invest money to invest in the infrastructure needed rather than relying on the parking income as it comes. So finally, um, how does this tie into mobility as a whole? If you look at the bottom right, so autonomous vehicles, as we know, is just one piece of the puzzle. Um, micro mobility is huge globally at the moment. Ride hailing, I mean, Uber is a household name. Logistics during COVID, we've had a huge increase in, in deliveries, need for loading bays. So how can we manage this dynamically? All of these things require some level of curbside access. So at Appyway, um, we are currently digitally transforming analog parking infrastructure and regulation orders in the UK, ready for the demands of intelligent transport it's through local authority tools, um, and also kind of making sure that that digital data set is ready for consumption by these services. And our longer term mission is to provide a dynamic curbside management system that enables cities to optimize and sustainably monetize their curbside infrastructure. So say um, Regent Street, big, big, big street in the middle of London, say there's air pollution high that day, can you shut that street down dynamically kind of the morning of route all the vehicles away and prevent it from becoming too polluted? So these are some of the questions that we're looking at. And the Park AV project was very much kind of a, a very interesting project with multiple stakeholders to be able to imagine scenarios such as this. Um, so finally, um, thank you very much for listening. Um, if you're interested in learning about the outcomes of the Park AV project, the executive summary is available to download. There's a link here. And I believe that the slides will be sent round after the, the conference if you would like to access it. Thank you. Thanks, Annie. I think we have done jump into the future with your presentation. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Automated mobility will be a topic in the next decade, maybe and certainly the one after. Uh, we see the curbside management has to be clear. First, to facilitate the user's compression of the world, the parking rules and in the midterm to facilitate the innovation from operators and in few words to permit the automated car. I think we have many questions uh, about the future. Can we expect that parking bays are monitored in real time in the future? This, yeah, that's a good question. So there's lots of companies, including ourselves, that are approaching this. So we currently use in-ground sensors. There are three towns in the UK that we do this in, um, Harrogate, Halifax, and Portsmouth. But there's a lot of companies, and we're investigating this, looking at um, doing this through cameras, uh, doing this through vehicle sensors as well. Um, similarly, we're working on a project um, with Transport for West Midlands, looking at how 
we can use um, cameras via 5G to check not just real-time availability of parking spots, but also the predictive availability, which is quite a key part of, because when you leave your house, you aren't going to be able to find kind of, it's, a, it's basically a last meter navigation as opposed to your full routing. So it is something that people are very interested in. How can we monitor these real time, not just to analyze and optimize, but to provide that information to lorries delivering, sorry, trucks, international English delivering um, to supermarkets, but all sorts of use cases. And it's, um, it is something that a lot of people are looking into. It's quite expensive. We're, I think we're trying to find ways to, to lower the cost for local authorities. Okay, uh, we have another question. What is your experience working with vehicle manufacturers in these topics? Uh, are they empathic towards our city approach parking cup size regu reg regulation? Sorry. That is, a, that is a very good question. We were really lucky to work with Jaguar Land Rover on this project, as with Milton Keynes and Coventry. Um, Jaguar Land Rover actually already has quite a good relationship with those councils because they're the kind of manufacturing areas for, for cars in the UK. I think it's this sort of project, it's very much a learning experience in the longer term. So I think it was, people were very much open to the fact that it was going to test them, that we were going to have to think of things that we weren't used to thinking of the ways it was. I mean, it's quite, um, it's a very different business model for everyone who is involved. And I think in the shorter term, we do talk to OEMs actually, because we do have that, that parking data and we're also talking to them about kind of sensing availability and things like that. So they know it's coming, um, but I can't speak on their behalf, unfortunately. Um, I have two other questions. Uh, do you think the agreed data standards for parking will make your and city's future ambition easier? Yes. I think standards standards are good. I know we've been involved in some of the standard shaping um, by one of my colleagues, but any any ability to because it's so fragmented at the moment as an industry, um, it's it'll very much help all involved um, to to be able to move forward with these policies and business models. Uh, can you also imagine including a dynamic use of the curbside beyond car stopping parking? Yes. Um, so, as a, we know that cars are a reality today, and we're not we're not anti-car or pro-car. We kind of just want to enable um, the the shorter term. It will be parking because that is how we envisage it today. We've been working with companies such as micro mobility companies who are consulting on where they should be parking their vehicles. Um, where the we've got tools, for example, to look at or consulting where EV charge points should be put, um, bicycle lanes, where the, the optimum place to put those. Um, I've lost the, the question has moved actually. Oh, um, sorry. Uh, can you also imagine including a dynamic use of the curbside? It's, uh, I can. Oh, beyond, it, beyond uh, parking. Yes, so so shutting down streets for events, for example. Yeah, um, I think it's air, po air pollution was one. Enabling different modes, different days. It's it's we can imagine what we think it'll look like, but it's things are moving so fast at the moment, and it's just important to make sure we can take into account lots of different parklets. Is one where can you put yes. in more parks? Uh, maybe a, a last question: When do you see autonomous people movers on the streets? According to the new uh, projects like Coexist, it seems to cause a huge disruption in traffic flows in urban areas. Autonomous people movers. Is that as in autonomous vehicles and pods, I presume? It's, it's an interesting one. I've been in this industry for a while and I remember um, in 2014, I was being told 2019, 2020, um, I think, I'm actually not as familiar with what the current projections are, but I think def we might be seeing them in some cases 2025, but I don't see them being prevalent until before 2030. That's just a personal opinion, um, but it's there's still a lot coming forward, and I'm sure there are people listening who might have a might have a more accurate answer to that one. Oh, you're on mute. Ellie, you're on mute. 
<laughs> I think we don't have any more questions. If it's okay for you, thank you, Annie. Thank you very much. Let's move to the next speaker. I think it's Birgitta Morin. If you can come on the stage. Birgitta, if it's okay for you. Seems we have a problem, technical problem. Maybe I can present you and you'll be there in a few minutes. Um, so, Brigitte, ah, she's coming. Uh, you are born in Sweden and you are a graduated engineer from the Lule University of Technology, and you came to France in the middle of the 19th. Hi, Brigitte. Hi. <laughs> I'd like to share your presentation, and then I finish your biography in this time. After some years in the building sector, you have been working for the city's land planning department, and then implemented the city's first biocode scheme as a sustainable mobility department officer, sorry, um, having previously led diverse European mobility projects such as Children's Streets, you know wants to give herself a new challenge with parking strategy, and it's a big challenge. <laughs> yes. So the good morning. The stage is yours. Yes. Yeah, so Thank you, Ali, and uh, good morning from uh, La Rochelle. <clears throat> uh, yes, in La Rochelle, we want to put, put uh, a face uh, on parking. Uh, La Rochelle is a city on the French Atlantic coast, uh, 80,000 inhabitants. Uh, the municipality now uh, aims to be a slow town, meaning that 80% of the streets will be limited to uh, a speed of 30 kilometers per hour. So the idea is not to struggle against the car, but to show solutions and offer people the opportunity to experience life without the car, uh, to change behavior and uh, imagine uh, public space uh, uh, with a different use. Uh, La Rochelle is a medium-sized city. Uh, people have short distance habits. People really want to park uh, as close as possible to their final destination. We had a good parking technology. We have 6,300 parking places. We have mobility payment service. We have smart parking meters, automatic number plates recognition, we have real-time parking availability and digital parking enforcement. But it seems to be a lack of the clarity of the parking offer. People don't want to pay for parking. Uh, people think sometimes that parking is the negative part of mobility. In the city, they don't really know where to park. They think it's expensive, so they prefer to go in the outskirts, in the big shopping centers, and there they know where to park. So in La Rochelle, we have a, we have a challenge to reach out, and we want to do this by parking pedagogy. Uh, we have. Uh, three actions for the moment, uh, with, which is also a part of a European project called Park for Sump. The first project is school visits in underground parkings. We want to open up these public spaces to students. 
we don't want to show the jobs that are related to parking and it's a way for us to give parking information to the households. Uh, one parking that we think is rather interesting is the whole old harbour parking. Uh, it's a parking just nearby the, the sea. It's only 10 meters between the sea and the parking. So it's rather interesting to, in a technical way, to present the construction, to present also the pump system, because so nearby the sea, we always have water <laughs> in it, of course. Uh, all the video surveillance system for all the parkings in La Rochelle is inside this parking. We also want the employees to describe their jobs in all about parking. And we want uh, also to explain the link between parking and mobility. The other action is uh, we want to put a face on parking with engage posters. Uh, this action with the posters is a win-to-win -win action with shopkeepers. We also want to show the people that are working in the parking department, as we call we are La Rochelle Parking, and we will give a positive point of view to parking. As I said, often parking seems to be the negative part of mobility. So we can see here some posters that we did with the shopkeepers. Uh, you can see, for example, on the right side, because in each dialogue, we, uh, uh, the shopkeepers give an information on the parking, but there's always a link with their shops. So on the right side, you can see the guys. They said that the, the use of the car can always be reinvented because in their bar, there's a, there's a car. Uh, the lady in the middle, uh, she said that uh, the old harbour parking is just in the end of my street because this parking is so close to her shop. And on the left side, you can see a lady, she said, do like me, go and park on the park and ride parking. It's only three euros for the day and the whole of the family can then go by bus into the city. It's in the price. So this is a way to, to help the shopkeepers in the city centre uh, to communicate, to give a, a, a face of parking and to give also something positive on parking. Here you can see the posters that we made with the employees uh, to show who is working, who is working in the parking department. It's not only cars, it's people behind. So, for example, on the right side, you can see uh, uh, Gaetan that is working in, uh, in the underground parking. Uh, and he says, uh, we are here for you 24-7. Uh, and that's true. The, the parking, uh, uh, underground parking is uh, cheaper than the on-street parking. Uh, it's open all of the time. And of course, you have people there all of the time also. So if you want to go to park in the middle of the night, uh, it's rather secure to know that you have people uh, not so far away if you have a problem. In the middle, you can see uh, a lady that is working uh, as an enforcer. Don't, uh, she said that you have to have the uh, team spirit to be an enforcer. And it's also very important to have a good uh, physical conditions. And uh, on the last side, uh, on the left side, you can see uh, Christine, and for her, it's the human touch that is the important thing. She's working in the agency, and she likes to have this contact with with people. All these posters uh, uh, have been printed out because we have, uh, they are on the walls in the underground parking, the old harbour parking. Uh, they are also uh, online at the homepage of La Rochelle and the homepage of uh, Engage. 
and uh, the shopkeepers also have them in their shops and on their homepage also. And to sum up, the last action is civil servant. We have employed civil, civil servant as parking ambassadors. Uh, we want them to implement a survey, a commerce and parking survey in the city center to understand uh, the link between parking and go shopping. Uh, we also want them to give parking information to the driving schools uh, for the young people they are that are having their driving license and uh, they are going to be uh, on the field to give information to users so all these actions uh, have to give a, a, a personal point of view of parking and to change uh, the image on it thank you very much Thank you, Birgitta. Uh, I think he, it's very instructive. And we always have to remember the objective of parking policies is rejecting the part of car traffic and promote alternative travel modes. And to be efficient, communication is essential for public authorities. I think this win-win idea can help us to make sure users, so visitors, shopkeepers, employees, understand how parking policies. Mm. We have one question in this chat. Did you see a change in parking habits since the start of the project? Yes, uh, something it, that is rather interesting is the shopkeepers. In the beginning, they said no parking, no business. <laughs> now they, uh, they have understood that they, they if we take away the cars from the, the street, uh, we will have more people, but that we really won't allow ourselves. We want the people to understand that the, 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 uh, the city is a human place. It's better to put the, the, the cars in the underground. It's uh, cheaper and you have more service and you have a more family friendly city. So yes, we have, we have uh, the, the shopkeepers now are on our side. They want us to take the cars away. And uh, now we have a uh, uh, pedestrian street in the city. So yes, it's changing. And another interesting question. Are you going to reduce the number of parking places or not? Yes, uh, we try to start in the heart of the city and go out from there. And each time that we create new uh, when we transform in resident areas, just nearby the city center, uh, from free parking to paid parking, we try to take away the same number of parking places in the city center to have pedestrian streets. And that's work. Um, do you have another question? Yes. Uh, how logistic operators are affected by the reduction for parking spaces? Can you re repeat the question, please? How logistics operators are affected by the reduction of parking spaces? Uh, but we don't really reduce the parking spaces. Uh, we 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 place them other where, and we. Uh, the on-street parking uh, isn't, doesn't really count. We, we try to put everything that is technical, we try to put it on off-street parking. And we really want to be, uh, to, that La Rochelle should be a, a family-friendly city with pedestrian streets. So that's the technical part is not really a problem for us. The problem for us is that people don't really want to pay want to pay for parking because the city is so small. So uh, they have uh, uh, these habits. So they want to park inside the, the, uh, the shop. So they really have to change the point of view of parking in Laos. That's uh, that's the problem now. Uh, before the next question, Birgitta, can you stop sharing your screen, please? 
we can see you. Ah, you leave the stage. So um, I will ask a next question and you can back your. Uh, it's okay, you hear me? Uh, how does your extensive parking technology help at parking habits? Does it help or is it neutral? I think the, the people, uh, sometimes with technology, we are searching for solutions on problems that we don't really have, you know? <laughs> uh sometimes we think that we have to we have to uh, uh find solution with technology but i don't think that we have to really uh communicate with the people and the habits are changing so fast so uh sometimes the, uh, the, the we have so many applications but um the challenge today also is that the, the people should use more of these applications but they don't really want for the moment. They don't want to pay for parking. So that's it. They they have to understand that the parking is a service and we don't want to have cars everywhere in La Rochelle. We don't want to see them in the in the street. We have a, from Belgium. We have a lot of free parking spaces, which still prevents people to use other types of parking facilities, park and ride on the road parking. Do you experience something like that as well in La Rochelle, regardless of your parking pedagogy? Uh, something that we experienced in La Rochelle in the city center is was in a European project called uh, Living Streets. And uh, we just uh, to start for, for one day, we took away all the, the, uh, the cars from the street. And we did that with the shopkeepers. This was, was a bottom up project. And if you can experiment together uh, and if you can show people uh, another way of using public space, it works. We also did uh, an experience with a school in La Rochelle called Children's Streets. And the uh, same thing for one day, we took away all the cars from the, the, the street. Uh, we put music in the street. The children could uh, try uh, bikes and so on. And if you can just experiment and uh, try other things in the in the in the street, uh, people want to change after. Maybe a question to make the link between the other presentation. We are the love of digital experience in this session. How do you look at this from the from your experience? In La Rochelle, uh, yes, yes, as I said, mass, uh, use of data. Yes, we have. Uh, I have one colleague that's uh, responsible for all this technical part. But as I said, it not really seems to be the problem for the moment. It's. Uh, I think La Rochelle is is a so small city that they don't really. They are. They aren't there yet. You know, they they. The problem for the moment is that they. 